Hey, welcome to another episode of Hooks and Ladders. We're uh, featuring guests uh, on the in these talks about songwriting, and um, one of uh, one of our favorite people is here with us today uh, in a beautiful shirt. By the way, um, <laughs> uh, this is the lovely, really generous Stephen Page. Hey, Stephen. Hello. How are you? I'm good. My name is Blair Packham, and of course, I'm joined by Alistair Bradley. And uh, we're we're so happy to have you here. Um, we're we're wondering we're wondering about you're a very prolific songwriter, um, not only with your work with Bare Naked Ladies, but also in with your your many solo albums subsequently. Um, how long does it take you to write a song? I appreciate that you called me prolific because I feel so unprolific. And honestly, like a part of of the my departure from the Bare Naked Ladies revolves around my lack of songs at that point too. Like, uh, uh, um, so the, the if I appear prolific, I feel like I've done my job. Uh, <laughs> I wish that it's, that songs all came quickly. I think everybody wishes that. You know, there's the classic Leonard Cohen quote where he says, "If I knew where the good songs came from, I'd go there more often." Um, you know, there are, I would say, a handful of songs that I've written. You know, as I get older, maybe closer to a dozen even uh, that I've written where they've just kind of come out. And when they've come out, they were good. Like they needed almost no editing. And they said what I wanted to say. And they were they were in, like things were in an interesting order. They didn't always follow the formula that I tend to, they weren't, they weren't verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus out. Like it was like something else happened. Right. And I, I don't know why and I don't know how, it's just there. And I dream of those ones. Those are the ones you do all the ones that take forever in order to get yeah. to. Um, and you kind of can't question them. Um, you can't really spend much time going, well, how did I get there? Um, there are lots of songs. The songs that I ha I think are the most high concept, like the songs where it's like, I, n I want to say this. I want to say this thing about January the 6th and the storming of the Capitol building. Those ones take forever, and they're never what I want them to be. For right. me, they're like, they're always... Uh, they feel awkward. They don't feel honest. They feel like they're they're prioritizing an idea over the musicality uh, of it. And, you know, I look at artists like, I don't know, somebody like Neil Young, who puts out a lot of stuff that's not great. But, but if you like Neil Young, as I do, it's still Neil, you know, and he, he's maybe he needs to edit better, but maybe he doesn't. Like maybe that the way he writes, I look at somebody like that and I go, well, that's pretty awesome. And we see, you know, we see our, some peers of ours who are on their third pandemic album or whatever right now. And I'm like, I, I started the pandemic with an album partially done and it's still not done because I, <laughs> whatever, I did other stuff and I wrote new stuff too. And it didn't, yeah. it doesn't fit into what I thought that album was. Yeah. Um, I think as I get older, I've gotten better at letting song come out quickly. Uh, some of that is like, don't overthink until I feel like I've got nowhere else to go. Um, where I think I used to spend too much time thinking about the audience. And some of that is like, you know, what, when I was in a band, like there's nothing more terrifying than putting a song, like bringing a song to your bandmates for the first time. Um, even if they're not fellow songwriters, like they are the harshest judges, uh, and the, and also and you see it, you know, in in that in the Get Back movie, we, you can see see them dismiss each other's songs out of hand, yeah. And you can feel the pain and the awkwardness of that, and they don't even kind of notice it. Um, that's what you know being in a band is like. So the idea of like bringing a new song to bandmates and having them kind of go, mm, oh, another one of those, or whatever, because they know you really well. Um, that's hard. And then you think about the audience and how are they going to respond and which one's going to be the single or whatever else. Now that I don't really think about that stuff anymore, like I just don't have, I don't have the expectation that a song is, it could potentially be a hit. Um, I think about, well, people who listen to what I do and come to see my shows or listen to my, my newer stuff, they want to hear where I'm at. 
And the best thing I can do is be honest about where I'm at. So that just means like follow the music and the song, you know, and then you use your own taste to decide whether the song needs tweaking or ditching or whatever else. Right. Right. It was a long answer. Sorry. That's a great answer. I, I wonder because I find in my own process, sometimes I need some external pressure in order mm -hmm. to take me to the finish line. Yep. And there have even been cases where my song hasn't been finished. I know it's just about there and it's not going to need a lot more, but I haven't been able to do it yet. And I've gone ahead and I've booked studio time knowing that, okay, now I've got, I've got that pressure, that external pressure. Mm -hmm. Between now and the date we go in the studio, I've got to finish this song. Yep. And it's never failed me. I've, I've never you know come out of it thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't done that because this is a big failure. So that seems to work for me, deadlines and, and even something as, as extreme as actually putting money in, into the book in the studio. Have you, have you found anything in your process that you can use as some external pressure or some part of your process that, that can help you to the finish line? Absolutely. Like th things like, like, like um, uh, deadlines for me totally work like I there have been lots of songs not lots but you know it's enough songs where I've actually like been on lying on the floor of the studio writing out the lyrics uh, as uh, to the third verse that I never finished or something like that um because it has to be done you're in the studio and you're doing this um you, or for instance like most recently I did this song that uh to honor Ryan Reynolds for his governor general's award and you know they asked me to write this song so I you know I had first of all you're writing for producers and like TV people, which is a totally different different thing from for me than normal. Um, and you know, so I tried to write as much of it as I could without having to invest too much time in case they went, nah, that's not really what we're thinking. Because you don't want to write like three verses about a very very specific verses about somebody else and then have them go, eh, can you try something else? Um, so did as much as I could and then you like you have a deadline. So you have no choice. Um, doesn't mean it's like the best song ever, but it's a song, you know, you just got to get it done. And I think about people who like write for TV or whatever else that just have to write on that kind of strict deadline. And you have to trust that what you do is good. Like that you, it's going to be good because you are good at your job. And that's like, you know, for, for somebody like me, i have like, it's, it took me about 50 years to realize that I was okay at my job. You know, so like I didn't have that the kind of confidence that I think some, you know, a, a TV or a musical theater writer might normally have. So, the the this uh, writing to brief is something we've talked about w with other writers, and you mentioned the uh, the 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 fa really fantastic song you wrote for Ryan Reynolds. Um, but is that something you've done a lot of, or a little bit of? You know, there were things like that we would. I'll go back in, back into the the '90s and early 2000s when when t movie soundtracks were everything. You know, the soundtrack to everything. There was a soundtrack. We were on the soundtrack to the TV show Friends, and then like the record company would try would give these songs to the TV production company who try and shoehorn these songs into the background of an episode, yeah. and then they could have a a soundtrack album to sell with it. Um, then there became there was a point where um, well, first of all, I remember getting a telephone call from um, uh, Robbie Robertson. Uh, I was very nervous and excited to talk to Robbie Robertson. He sure. was working on this brand new movie called Shrek and telling me all about it. And he, he would send me, you know, some scenes from it. But uh, they wanted to use some of our songs. And uh, but as part of this, would we consider... Um, doing a cover of the monkeys I'm a believer and at that point it was like oh those monkeys comparisons it's like it wasn't cool to be funny at that point it is now yeah. now and now you can be funny on, and make music and no one goes oh that's not real music they go yeah. that's great or I don't like that or whatever it hasn't there's no but we dealt with this like humor and music should not be together thing and that's what the you know the monkeys were seen as being lightweight I was thrilled to see kind of the great outpouring of respect that Michael Nesmith got when he passed. But yeah. um, anyways, it was like for us being comparing to the monkeys, just when we'd finally broken through, felt like it was potentially career suicide for us. So we passed and uh, they gave it to uh, Smash Mouth instead. 
and uh, you know, I just it, it was one of my first first I- I engagement in that kind of world. I thought, okay, it's it's all about wheeling and dealing. So then we started getting people calling and saying, "Do you want? Can you do a song for our movie?" And multiple times, Ed and I would sit down and write a song specifically for their movie, and then they would reject it. Um, one of them was Shrek Two, where they came around and they said. Um, uh, we want you to write a song for the opening of this movie. And, uh, and we're like, look, you know, we've been screwed around on this before. Are you talking to other people? Is this on spec or whatever? And they're like, no, no, no. We just want you. And we're like, okay, well, we'll write a song for you. But, uh, you know, and we're happy to, to change it however you like as long as, like, we have the gig. Oh, you have the gig. Absolutely. We write this song for them and never hear back from them again. <laughs> and, uh, um, Counting Crows ended up writing the song for it when ended up winning the Oscar for best song and all kinds of stuff as well and it turns out we find out from talking to other bands that they asked every band out there at the time so Third Eye Blind and Semisonic and well, it asked every other band to write a song Goo Goo Dolls and the funny thing is it, that whole opening sequence was tempt to uh, Island in the Sun by Weezer yeah. So they needed it to be the same tempo and changed in from verse into chorus and chorus into bridge and whatever else and ramp up and ramp down at exactly the same times. So right. if you want if you hear that accidentally in love by Counting Crows, you will hear that it's the structure ex- is exactly the same as the Counting Crows. I wonder how many other songs or as the Weezer song. I wonder how many other songs out there. <laughs> I'd love to make an album of all the songs pe- people wrote. It just felt, it felt like that was like everybody just sold their soul at that point. So we stopped writing for spec, like in, until we could get guaranteed that we would. There was a Disney a Disney movie called uh, Chicken Little, where they had tempted in "It's All Been Done," our song, yeah. um, into the opening sequence. So they said, like, "We'd like you to write a, a song, but like a different song." But we had to um, write a song that was the same length and shape. As it's all been done, but we just changed the chords around and like moved the shape of the of the chord progression, uh, and had Ed sing it instead of me. So it wasn't exactly the same song, but to to try to ape your own song was a funny thing, a funny thing to be asked to do. But that yeah. song actually made it into the movie. Did that make it harder? Like, to, to, like <laughs> I would think in some ways it would be harder than than just being free to. You know, to write a two-minute song to this, you know, you know, with these certain parameters, it wasn't that hard. And I think for Ed, like he he kind of took that by the by the reins and ran with it. And I think that's what like for him, then he took took that and flipped that into writing the song for the Big Bang Theory, um, which was like really uh, it comes back to. I think he may have been a little ahead of me on this, the trusting your own improvisational instincts. And, um, you know, that like that's kind of where I got to with the Ryan Reynolds song. It's like, just go with what I think is funny, what I think is melodically interesting, and not think too much about what they want. You've got your brief, just do it. And then they can tell you whether it's good or bad. I mean, I've worked on several, like, stage musicals that never came to fruition um, for other people, like where other people had written the, the book or there were other producers who like brought me in to try and write songs for a property they already had. And they're like, this is great. This is great. And then something in them just goes, eh, I don't like it. And you kind of, you know, look at it and go, well, I don't know. I mean, they didn't tell me to do anything different. And I think this stuff's great. You just have to like eventually be okay with that. And I think, but do I want to spend my career serving people's indistinct whims. <laughs> you know, like I have my own indistinct whims I can serve just yeah. as poorly. <laughs> and so often they you know, they're not musicians, you know, they're not musical people. Right. So so they don't really they just know what they like. And well, we did a song for here's another example of movie stuff. It was um when Ron Howard did the Grinch movie. Um and uh, I guess, you know, he and his kids were fans of the band and stuff, so he brought us on board, and uh, uh, we were already recording in L.A., and they brought, like, the movie. The CGI hadn't been done yet, so it was all just against green screen, which was pretty funny. Yeah. They, and they brought the movie with the security guard standing outside the door while we watched the movie, and then they had to take the, the 
videotape back with them. And then they said, we want you to write a song, choose a scene that you want to write a song for. And so we wrote a song, Ed and I wrote the song Green Christmas for this one specific scene. And uh, then we went to record it. And Ron Howard came to the studio that day while we recorded it. And he has, and he's the first to say he has no musical ability. Like he, do, he doesn't speak the language. But he knew exactly what he didn't want. And it was great. Like I, it was the best exp experience we'd had being directed by someone who didn't speak the musical language because he was very clear about no, not that, yes, more of this, um, and giving examples of how he wanted it to make him feel when he heard it. Uh, maybe like it, he would just, even just stuff like say, I want this part to feel tougher than it feels. It feels too light. Um, those are all like super helpful because it's his movie and it's his vision. And, you know, he's, he is as nice a guy as you want him to, you know, want to imagine that he is, but he's also incredibly focused and dedicated, which is like, that's how we are. You know, so we found a kind of a kindred spirit in him and thought, well, this is great. And then the movie came out and it wasn't over that scene at all. It was, <laughs> the song was in the movie. It was like in the ending credits. But, um, but yeah, it wasn't in that scene. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Frustrating. But, but still, good that yeah. it's in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, we have to, we have to wrap up. Uh, uh, this is, uh, as, as always, it's so great talking with you about this stuff and, and your generosity in uh, being so open about, about your process and, and your experiences. It's, it's really lovely, and it's always great to, to interface with you. So nice thank to see you. <laughs> thanks so much, Stephen, um, and thanks, Alistair. We'll uh, we'll be back for another episode of Hooks and Ladders pretty soon. See ya.